Hey, one more thing before you go. Take two. Hey, one more thing before you go. What happens after we die? Ascension? Reincarnation? What if we had a way to look way beyond the confines of religion and societal norms and to understand the truth behind so many of the traditions, assumptions, and beliefs that shape modern-day life? Stay tuned as we talk to a man that has those unique answers. I'm your host, Michael Hurst, and welcome to One More Thing Before You Go. My guest in this episode is Stephen Machette. He is an American entertainment entrepreneur, a film producer, and the author of 10 books. He's a music publisher and a manager and a lawyer of talent, as well as the owner of a record label. Machette has represented Electric Light Orchestra, Genesis, Peter Gabriel, Phil Collins, Ready for the World, Leonard Cohen, Phil Spector, Snoop Dogg, Stacey Jackson, Phil Crown, and Bobby Brown, to name a few. He grew up with legends like Frank Sinatra. In Stephen's 10th book, We've Got to Get Out of This Place, he explores the smoke and mirrors that surround humanity, religion, and philosophy, revealing the truths that remain hidden in plain sight. He delves deep into the exploration of earthly death, ascension, and reincarnation, and draws convincing research-based conclusions to five of the most significant questions for mankind, including what happens after we die. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. I'm honored to be here. If I may just edit a little. Sure. Right now I have I have a record label with my wife who I married up there in your territory up in Sedona. And we have a label it's called SSK Records. And we've opened it and we have music coming out all over the world. I can't stop acting the artist. And I said to Debbie, as long as you're okay with this, and she loves music, so as long as you're okay with it, because it's a, there is no hours in creation, and there's no hours in perpetuating a belief. So that's what we're doing right now. We have that, and I'm making movies, and it's a very active, active uh, life that I'm living. And I'm honored to meet you. And the story you told me earlier is a story every hermit, human must hear, because what you said to me, you told me that the eternal energy of the eternal mind, not the physical mind, but the eternal mind can help conquer all odds except for what just can't be fixed. Exactly. But the love that you had and the support that you had to help you get there is better than anything I could sit and tell you because it's you. It's, it, you're a blessing and you're a tribute. And I honor the fact that I'm here talking to you. Stephen, thank you very much. It, it, for the listeners out there, we were talking about my journey from uh, uh, getting injured in the line of duty and my, and my time in a wheelchair and uh, being told I would always be there. And as all of you that do uh, listen to this program, which I'm grateful for, you know that uh, uh, it was a journey walking out of that wheelchair and, I'm, and I haven't looked back since. So Stephen, thank you for recognizing that. I appreciate that very much. It's a great life story for me. Well, speaking of life stories, we're going to, this is, Stephen, this is your life. <laughs> are you, are you Peter? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, we'll, we'll call it a little, uh, a little crossover. <laughs> um, I'm glad you, re yeah, that you, we, we remember that show. <laughs> uh, I just kind of, I like to start at people's, I, I love your journey. I love the journey that you've taken. And uh, I really want to get into your new, you know, the new endeavors with the, especially with the the book that you've written and the, the new music that you're working with. But I kind of like to start at the beginning. Can can you tell me where you grew up? Well, I landed in planet Earth, and I came out in a in an island that we call Manhattan. And Manhattan is really an Indian word, although no one wants to own up to it. 
And it's just, it was a beautiful place to begin. So I came out of mom. I had a father, my father, we all do. And my two parents basically were young uprising. Dad had gotten out of World War II. This is in 1952. He went to law school. He became a lawyer on the GI Bill. And my dad ended up a lawyer, but he couldn't work for the big WASP, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant firms. So he had to go out on his own. And he ended up doing negligence work. And I say this because you probably like this. He got in, got a call from a friend, a World War II vet. His buddy said, listen, I've got a very famous man and he's going to call you tonight because we got into a car crash and I want him to help you to help him. His name was Sugar Ray Robinson. And that became my father's first entertainment client, real one. And dad ended up talking his way into being the business manager. And dad ended up handling Sugar Ray Robinson's career. But at the same time, as, as in our world today, entertainers and boxers and sports athletes, they all share a common place. They share the, um, basically the uncertainty of being a star for the moment. Because those lights don't last forever. You have to create a new life, a new light. And Sugar Ray introduced Dad to bands like the Platters. And, you know, he had Clyde Otis and Clyde McFadder and the Drifters. And all of a sudden, Dad started drifting to England because he wanted to go back there since he was there in World War II. And he went back there and different artists, different up-and-coming artists would come over and meet with him. And, you know, different promoters and different producers. And Dad ended up bringing back you know, during the English um, musical rock history, he ended up being the U.S. lawyer for people like Donovan, Herman Hermits, Dave Clark Five, the Kinks, the Who. And what happened was I asked people questions. I, I've i never stopped asking questions. It's like I reincarnated to ask questions because I had five questions that my whole life I wanted answered. And no one could answer me because I was going into sacred forbidden territories I wanted to know why we couldn't get along. I wanted to know why you and I are taught that we're not the same. I wanted to know why we believe it. I wanted to know why all of a sudden I'm told I, I'm, I'm a religion and my religion has a different God than that other religion. I wanted to know why we hated each other. I wanted to know why man would kill each other. I wanted to know what is this? Why don't we understand? And I believe from the day go, that we were all the same. So all my books and all my themes and my entire path here in life has been a quest to understand who are you? Who am I? What is the difference between you and I? Why are we here? What are we here to do? And then, okay, you're dead, but you're an energy force. You know, we live in a machine called a body. The, uh, the body, it's okay. I know I'm not my body but my body is my temple. And Sugar Ray Robinson is the one that taught me this. He would come to our house. We lived in a place called Roslyn and he would go run the hills that we had. It's one of the few places that has hills in uh, Long Island, which is Nassau and Suffolk. It's also Queens and Brooklyn, but they don't teach that to you. And he would run and I would ride a bike and he forever told me, take care of your body, exercise it, don't waste it. I know you're going to do whatever you're going to do, but never do anything that will hurt your body. Never do anything that will take you out of your temple. And I pretty much listened to it. I made that a way of my life. And whenever I may have strayed from that, I got right back. I don't like being unhappy. And I've learned Kundalini energy, which helped me stay in my energy. And, and then when I read that the Catholic Church tells you that yoga is the devil's womb, like he came out. And you don't need them telling you what to do. And kundalini energy is the most important thing in exercising kundalini energy, which is really the phoenix called your navel. What you do is you pump it up and you got the energy ready to go. And you know about getting up your energy. Yep. They can't stop you from lighting a fire in your body. You may be in northern Phoenix, but you are a phoenix. You're a spirit that lit that body up. And your body was not ready to go and bless you, here you are. So that's what I did. I went to law school. I was a public defender there. I ran for the United States Senate. I ran for the U.S. Congress. I think both parties are nuts. We, we live in a world where we're taught the truth. We're taught 
A government works for you. A government represents the people. We run for an office to be part of a government that works for the people. The people do not work for your government. They do not need to be divided into two political parties, whereas Nancy Pelosi very non-politely had her DCC tell me that I have to echo what the Democratic Party wants me to say to the 26th district. I wanted to be the congressman in, out of Key West. I loved Ernest Hemingway's energy. I may not have liked the way he exposed his energy, but I thought, what better place to be a congressman than to walk around the Keys, right? Yeah, exactly. Anyway, I, did, and I didn't get it, but I ran against Rubio, and I did one debate with Rubio, and then afterwards, I'm like, he ain't talking to me <laughs> this night. And I ran as an independent because the Democratic Party told me they already selected this senator. And I'm like, we're having a primary, and um, I guess it was the end of August in 2016, but they selected who gave them the most money. And anyway, so I, my politics is real simple. It's people politics. You know, I met a band called The New Edition. I met their five mothers from Roxbury, Massachusetts. And I figured I'm going to learn about the underprivileged. I'm going to learn about the rationing that goes off and how they take care of them and why they created a world where we're going to help people survive so we're going to throw money at them so they get out of society. But to get the money, you can't have the father in the house. It's like, are you kidding me? Because the wow. father could work. Not everyone could work. They can't. You know, and I I did the new edition. I did them all the way through, if you listeners are there. I did Bobby Brown. And what I mean by I did Bobby Brown, I love these people. And, yes, I put together a team. And his teams will show you, like, I don't know what happened to your Phoenix Suns. How did they lose when they had the best record in basketball? But you lose. Sometimes teams yeah. go astray. And the trick is you're part of a team. And Earth is a team. And when you put together a team, you become a matrix. And that's what my book, Gods and Gangsters, is about. I tell you how the matrix is to create, promote, and enhance the careers where all of a sudden this God that you now believe in was put together by gangsters who did it for pure profit. I did that. I did it because I economically knew how to do it, and it was like playing a game. That's why that cover you showed people is a game board. We came to Earth. Why did we incarnate and come here? We came here for the candy, for the sugar. But you know something? When you eat sugar, you're going to have a pain. All of life has its joys and its pain. It mm -hmm. has light and it has darkness. And you need to figure out how to navigate that life between light and darkness. It's a tightrope. And you stand on the tightrope. And if you get too much light, you'll fall off and you've got a problem because you'll burn. If you get too much darkness, you'll never come back into the light. Get on the tightrope. That's the game of life. It's the tightrope. You <laughs> sit there and you walk it. It's a beautiful thing. But I'm going to let you ask me questions because nice I can balance. rattle. Oh, that's, I'm having a, I'm, I am taking all of it in. I, I agree with you on everything that you just said. So that just makes me feel good to hear it out loud. And uh, to kind of get it coming right from there, your mouth to, to my ears and to my soul. So, yeah, it's okay. It's all good. <laughs> you remind me of Dennis Hopper, by the way. Dennis Hopper. Well, you remind I, me of Dennis Hopper. I guess that's a good it's thing. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I loved him. Yeah, Dennis Hopper is a brilliant artist. Uh, I loved his movies. I love what he stood for. So that's a compliment. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wear it. It's, you've got his energy. <laughs> I, and you know, it, it, I love what you said about the fact that we are on this planet. It is a balance. We have to take, we have to walk that tightrope. But if we don't balance it correctly, and you know, we talked about it earlier. You know, I could have gone to the light side like I'm doing now, or I could have gone to the dark side where I was. I was in a very bad place for a little while because of my injuries, because of my resentment, my anger, and everything that went to it. It took me a little bit of time to straighten back up on that rope and to walk the path along that rope to keep balance. You know, I'm a human being like everybody yeah. else, so occasionally we'll lean over to the dark side, occasionally we'll lean over to the, the light side, but but you're right, it's, just, it's a balance that we have to keep straight and narrow. That's... In, I've got to read, I'm going to have to go back and read your first book. Or Gods and Gangsters, pardon me. The um, yeah, yeah. A brilliant, uh, yeah, it sounds brilliant. I, I'm just grateful. 
I'm grateful that the angels brought us together. So it, I think that uh, uh, your philosophy in life is a wonderful uh, introspect on us as an individual, us as a community, and us as a whole, as well as energy in the whole universe, in that we all have to work together to make this work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pretty and you cool. got to be aware of the energy. I've lived in, I've took part in life in over 100 countries, and I consider that a flat out blessing. I've got in the middle of their stars, the people that they bow down and pray to. And, you know, and I went to territories that never met anyone that represented any of them. So I was able to share with people the truth of life. There's no difference. We want love, we need love, and we live to discover love. Not understanding we are love. We came from a supreme being of love. And we fight it. Well, I want more. Well, good luck. <laughs> How could you yeah. have more love than love? You know, well, exactly. Good luck. It, <laughs> well, there are a few of us that actually, I think, they have really experienced what true love really is. And, and, and I don't mean true love as in the romantic comedy type true love. It kind of fits within there a little bit as well. But um, when you've been to a dark place, and you're pulled out of that dark place with those around you and those people that support you and those organizations that support you in a very positive way, um, you understand what true love is. You understand what, what that feels like to have that around you, to wrap itself like a hug around you and to hold on to you and support you. And it, uh, it makes your heart work good. Well, your heart... A heart is proof of how to live. Your heart, what it does is it breathes in and it breathes in oxygen created by plants. And then when you breathe out, you breathe out the carbon dioxide that the plants need. It's a game. You've got to mm. you got to be giving and taking like a heart works. It gives and it takes. If all you do is give, you'll fall on your face. If all you do is take, you'll fall on your back. You got to balance yourself. That's, I don't know, that's one of my rules of life, balance. Well, you know, it, I, I got to ask you, I, it balances 100%. You need to balance. The, the, you know, that's why I meditate every day, to balance me. It gives me, yeah, yeah. Gives me peace. It gives me the opportunity to reflect. Serenity. Gives up, serenity gives me the opportunity to be grateful, uh, you know, to, for what I have around me and who I have around me. Uh, it gives me that moment to take a, take a breath and uh, just be. Take a breath yeah, yeah. and just be, and appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> That's the present. Because of my your background and my background, I have to ask this question. How do you think music plays into that? Is it like a, is, do you agree that music is a universal language? It's been it. Music is you. Your body is made up of particles. You're not taught that. You know, and some people call them crystals, but you're moving particles. And what happens is you're a vibration. You're a walking vibration. People are not taught that. When you come walking into a room or you're sitting down there, you're a vibration. And you, what you do is you tune your body to hear the song that your body's making. When your parents created you, that was two energies making a musical, whatever you want to call it. A symphony. An orchestra. A symphony. A symphony of love. They created you. You're a song. You are a song made by mommy and daddy. We're all songs. And then what the songs do is you walk around. And when they tell you the law of attraction, what you're doing is you're attracting energy that's sort of similar. Or yeah. you're attracting energy that are hitchhikers. And they'll take your energy. And so what you need to do is to learn what is what. You know, if, if you don't feel comfortable with someone, listen to it and get out of there. Don't sit there trying to convince people. And if you're upset that someone rejected you, well, I tell people that's God's protection. Yeah, God protected you from someone that wasn't right for you. Just get on with it. Just live it. But so to answer you, through music, specifically what you asked me, music is a vibration that is reproduced by mankind for the purpose of communicating with you the joys and horrors and the love and the pain that you have in your heart that you want to give to others. And it becomes a memory. Because what it will do is it will stick in your mind. Remember the first song you ever heard? 
You remember where you were when you heard it. You remember who you loved, who you hated. You remember your second grade school teacher, if it happened in that era. You were, you attach memories. Because yeah. in the end, when we leave planet Earth, we become a memory. And in that second, that doesn't exist. That moment, that time stands still when we're out of our bodies. And that's what my book's about. You have the choice of coming back, reincarnating here on Earth. And I've spent many years studying with the different Dalai Lama's peoples and the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Indians to talk about going to the beyond. And I've spent a lot of time. You have another choice. If you could lose the density, the weight that comes with an attachment, that's what they don't teach you. When they say attachment, there's a weight. You got to take something. When you lose that weight, and that's what I share with you in the book, you become as free as a bird. You become the butterfly that you're meant to be. You're not coming back. And when you come back, you're like a moth. You're a butterfly, and you're going to ascend out of this matrix called planet Earth, and you're going to go to the beyond. And my study of Egyptian mysticism to understand the secrets hidden in plain view as I dissected what we're taught, I'm like, this is outrageous. This, they're telling me there's other dimensions. And I study quantum physics like few people do, except those that get paid for it. And I don't pay people that get paid for studying the art of living. You know, I get, I enjoy meeting people that happen to be what they do. But I believe as scientists, it's not someone that stops and says, this is all you need to know. No. Because things change. The energy, the music sources, the winds, the water moving, the winds moving. I recorded plants. I put plants out making noise where they communicate with each other to build a social network that we call a biodiversity sphere. I, I, I just want to learn more. I don't want to stop. I want to discover what I can. And as long as I can, talk to people and say, hey, here it is. To sit there with a band. We have a band called Rocks Revolt and the Velvets, to sit there and give them the encouragement to believe they could conquer the world when they're from an area just north of Naples, Florida. It, it's powerful. And if I could sit here talking to the youth and telling them never to give up and to have that giving them examples as to how you could win, and you're one of the many examples, and you're a blessing to know, that's what it is. It's the power of suggestion, the power of proof that this is what I did. Go do it. Go discover love. Don't give in. Don't become someone's robot. Don't harm people. Give everyone their own way. But get what's yours and find some energy that you love and you could share it with. If the energy dissipates and the lives change, so be it. You don't own the energy. No one owns. Love is not ownership. Love you know, is joy. The people who are watching this obviously can see this in your face and in your actions and the positivity that exudes around you and from you. They see the genuine in your eyes. They see the honesty and the integrity that just eludes from you. It, it just, it, it, it shoots out. It shows. So the people who are listening, you need to watch this video when, when you get the opportunity to. Um, reality is, I love that concept that you, that you just spoke about. I think that we forgot, not all of us, of course, because obviously you're there, but we have forgot the art of communication. We forgot the art of that. what you said earlier about the plants and putting them together and that they talk to each other and they continue to build a community within that arena and that we're part of that as well. I think that gives, um, gives us a kind of a meaning of life a little bit. Do you agree? Yeah, it's, I have the school of sacred knowledge.com. Okay, you go there. One of my guest lecturers, and he's my artist, Steve Scully, we're having a series of discussions about interspecies communications. And it's outrageous. I mean, this is a friend of mine that I've known for years, and I attract these energies. And he sits there and tells you what the Indians used to tell you. He sits there and tells you what they call all the. Um, the shaman or whatever, you know, the, sh the shaman, the shaman. Yeah. Shaman. They live, they live with nature. You go to these pharmaceutical companies, all they're doing you is selling you a plant and they make it a chemical version of what the plant did, you know, and it's, 
That's where it all comes from. So they can mass produce it. And it's not what nature gave us. You know, when you live in a world of a global economy, it's like, it's insane. I live in Miami, Florida. I have coconuts. If you're living up there in Lewiston, Maine, you don't need to have a coconut. You're not getting sun beating down on you. And they sit there. When I was a big growing up in Florida, we had oranges and we had grapefruits. And then we signed a NAFTA contract where now the oranges are grown in <clears throat> Mexico. I mean, are you me? The trees live in Florida. And then grapefruits used to stop at all the um, turnpike stops and everything. There'd be all this grapefruit for you to buy. Good luck finding it. You know, it's not there. The cactuses, I love cactus. They don't teach you how to eat cactus. That's one of the best meals you could get. Yeah. But why do the Mexicans have to sell, sell it to us instead of us here in America? Live and eat what's in your community. We don't need to serve food that's been frozen. I mean, we live yeah. in an industrial, agricultural, military complex. And all we care about is the banks that we give the interest payments to, which if you believe in Jesus, is why he was hung anyway. Because he said, you can't go lending money to people and charging them interest. Yeah. You help your brother and your sister and your whatever. You help your family. So you're punishing them because you gave them money? It's like a hey, timeout. Yeah, I agree I with that. I, I, you know, I agree with that 100%. That's the reason I'm not a Protestant Catholic any longer, because I, I believe that organized religion is not, uh, they're only there for a specific purpose, and it's monetary. It's not to go out and help people. They take your money. Exactly. I left the Catholic Church because um, my parents had gotten divorced, and they excommunicated my mother, who was a devout Catholic, couldn't, said you couldn't take communion, and stopped coming to church, and uh, did the same thing to us kids. And we had no play in whether or not my parents got divorced. And we still got the fallout from that. And That's I, horrible. I had to when and, I went. And you wore that scar until you realized they're lying. Yeah. How dare I, they? Yep. When I went back to get married, uh, myself in the Catholic Church, we had to ask for readmittance. I had to ask for readmittance in the Catholic Church. It was like, I didn't do anything wrong in the first place. So at that time, I said, you know, uh, organized religion is um, when you when you look at organized religion, you look at uh, I can't remember his name now. It's the, the guy with every Sunday he's got the big flashy um, mansion and the the Ferraris and the Rolexes and the um, just with the guy in Houston, Texas. Yeah, yeah. And during the floods, he's sitting up on his church is sitting up on a on, on a high high area, the doors were all locked because he didn't want anybody that was muddy or dirty coming in when everything was being flooded. They needed a, a place of refuge. Yeah, I can't remember. This guy in Houston, I've been in this place. I've been down there. And I, the thing's insane. He wouldn't let people in there during the hurricane. And that's what I'm saying. And he he's would, sitting there. Let yeah, he wouldn't let them in. You know, when the United States Constitution was written, the word church meant the Vatican. They didn't tell you you can't have local churches. Separation of church, the Vatican, the government, without king or pope. You know, it's like they don't get it. We need a government for the people, by the people, of the people. And that's the premise. Now and these men money. were learned men. All money. All money. Every, all money. every move they make, every breath they take. I love yeah. when they're figuring out how to feed the people and they're talking about the trillions of dollars. The yeah. first thing you would do, if I was the government, I owned your house, you would come back to me and say, look, I can't pay the interest. You've got 535 clowns in that office. Not one of them said to the budget, we're going to stop letting the Federal Reserve charge us interest. Yeah. They don't have the money. They print the money. And we believe this, and I'm now telling you my political viewpoints, there's something wrong. We live in a world where we have to have Father God and a man-made image telling us it's okay. And everyone needs to hear this, and I'll just, I'll go to any altar or any cross there is. You and I have the same supreme being that created us. Yep. It's the same thing that Thomas Jefferson wrote about. It's disgusting what we do. We look for a father God to pat us on the back. Father God gave the Ten Commandments. And that's what I write about. You know, 
honor your father and honor your mother, Mother Earth. Honor it and live here and find out why you wanted life. You got it. Love it. And let's go. Build your team. Live a dream. That's okay. Our political views uh, kind of are aligned. I agree with that 100%. I was watching a thing this morning, which, again, I'll. this is part of my political views. I was watching the uh, hearings this morning that they were bringing in witnesses uh, from the mass shootings in Uvalde and uh, Buffalo and these areas. And um, this uh, representative from uh, uh, Louisiana comes on, Higgins, and, you know, he says, well, when I was a young patrolman back in 2005 and um, I went on my, this call, I got a call for a man down in the street. And I showed up to the man down the street and, you know, I leaned down there and I could see he was dying. He had a head injury and I leaned down and picked him up. And I said, what happened? He said, I got hit with an ax handle and he died right there in my, in my arms. And he died with an ax handle, not with a gun, with an ax handle. And he goes, yeah. I will never impede upon anybody's right to own a weapon. And it's like, what the hell does that have to do with what's going on right now, number one? Number two, as a law enforcement officer, as a career law enforcement officer, I know damn well you saw more than just somebody hit with an ax handle. You went to those shootings. You saw what they do. You've seen what an AR-15 does to a, to a body. It mutilates them. The kid in Uvalde, some of these kids in Uvalde were decapitated, literally decapitated. They had to use DNA to identify which kid was what. And I, 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 I had to tweet him, literally. and said, don't call yourself a yeah. cop. Don't call yourself a cop because you, you have no humanity. You have no compassion. So there, I, that's my little soapbox. <laughs> no, but it's true. He's a beast. You know, real quickly... If you look at a body, your body has seven engines, okay? And then chakra. they poo-poo what I teach you, but they have seven chakras, all right? So the Vatican makes those naughty words, right? But those engines work, and they're not part of you. They're part of your body. And your bottom three chakras, right, are the ones that make your body work. And what all of us do, we're beast. We eat, we sleep. And we defecate and then we reproduce. That's what every animal does. What mankind needs to do is, okay, after I do what I need to do as a beast, how do I use my top three chakras? How do I use my ability to communicate? How do I use my ability to shut my mind off when I meditate and to get into my space, stop acting like beast and communicate with my crown chakra? How do I get there? where I could help make mankind better. Because each move that we make can make us all better. It can make heaven here on earth. We can move mountains when we act together. And the heart is the balance. And you said something earlier, and for whatever it's worth, here's an answer for you. Life is about art. How does your heart work? What is a heart? It's he, H-E, but get rid of that. It's art, A-R-T. Where are you living? You're living on earth. Okay, there's five letters. Go to the second, third, and fourth letter. What do you got? You got art. You're living on earth to make art, to make what you can only do as a physical form, using the intuition and your ingenuity of building a team and creating more than there was before. And it's like, that's the blessing. And, and in this book, I just share with everyone quantum physics. That's and brilliant. I'd be so honored. If, and I, by the way, I got reviewed. They called it the number one spiritual book out right now. I beat the other the other guys that do what that that preacher does. They say, hey, I've got a refund. I've got an eye for you. Sign up, pay me $100 a week. It's like, what are you doing? God is, God is great and God wants me to have money and you give it to me instead of you. What, what are you telling me? It's crazy. That's brilliant. That's just brilliant. Yes, it is. And congratulations for that, uh, by the way. That's, that allows us to, uh, uh, that's a very interesting perspective, looking at it from, from that. I, you know, every morning, I, I go out on the back patio, and uh, I do it early now because it gets hot or later now here, but I go out on the back patio. My dog even knows, hey, if I miss the time, my dog's in front of me looking up at me like, hey, Dad. Let's go out. 
and we sit on the back <laughs> patio, and I listen to the birds. I talk to the birds. I talk to my trees. I talk to my bushes. I talk to my flowers. I talk to what I have back there. I'm one with the universe in my arena and grateful to Mother Nature and grateful to the universe what I have in, in for those being there. And believe it or not, my trees and my bushes and uh, my flowers and everything along that line thrive. Because yeah. They hear it every day. I say it out loud. So what you said earlier about communicating with nature, uh, communicating and living with Mother Nature and our Earth and our environment, um, absolutely 100%. You know, you need to try it. You need to open your eyes, open your heart, um, which again, what you just said with the analogy with he and art here on earth and creating art, uh, again, brilliant. I'm walking away from this with a whole new perspective on the word heart uh, and the feeling of heart that I had never felt before. Uh, so thank you for that. I think that um, you answered the question, the meaning of life, very effectively. Very effectively. It's to, it's to create nothing less yeah. and to do it with love and you will join the eternity. And when you go back, because your body can't last forever because it's it was not created. It was made to last. You get 120 years. <laughs> and I will, I'll give you a funny story. I went looking for people that beat the 120, right? So one time I'm at this new age thing in New York and this guy comes out and my friends, I had crystal bowls and I, I used the crystal bowls and we made, made a album of uh, singing bowls, crystal bowl collection. And I went to all these different healers. I kept telling them, what's your secret? They said, you, like what? We met you. You're the one that's going to tell our story. You're the one, oh. they said to me, more than one of them, you're the one that will walk into any fire and have the courage to put it out with the energy. And, you know, and I'm not an angel. I, I'm a true rock and roller. And if I went off the cracks here or there, I apologized if I harmed anyone, but I never intended to harm anyone, let alone everyone. I just wanted what I, I wanted to get the communication out there. I wanted it to just go forward. And it's so important that people understand that's what we're here to do. You know, it's to communicate with each other. It is. Get it out. It is 100%. Uh, that's why I have this podcast. So I can talk to yeah, yeah. worldwide. Doing well. We can talk worldwide. It puts us sitting in front of each other like we're having a, well, I'm having a cup of tea. Um, do you, you Earlier you mentioned something about so you, um, being here and uh, the, the body is only meant to last so long. So uh, what what happens when we die? Oh, I'll tell you that one second anyway, because this is what I didn't finish as I drifted. But anyways, so I found this guy at this new <laughs> I, age place, and he's wearing all orange. Yeah, we all do that. He's wearing all orange. And they said to me, my bold people, they said, he's 118 years old. Holy so God. I'm like, right? So I look at him. And I try to shake his hand, and he's got two handlers next to him, and they wouldn't let me near him. And I'm like, what is this? I said, I just want to shake the hand of someone that succeeded like this. Oh. They said, no. They said, bow to him. Show him, you know. I'm like, okay. I do this. I look at him. I go, why couldn't I touch you? And he looks at me, and he says, son, this is how I protect myself. I don't know you. I don't know what germs you're carrying. And I don't want anything near me that I don't know. I'm like, okay, I get it. Well, he's on but he was wearing orange. I asked him, yeah, and he was wearing orange. I said, does orange do it? <laughs> does it keep away the energies because it's orange? <laughs> oh, that's it was funny. fun. Yeah, that's, yeah, orange, from my old line of business, orange means criminal. <laughs> so you're in an orange and jumpsuit. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. They put yeah. you in orange uniforms. Maybe they want you to light up your day. Who knows? Yeah, you, you know, go. and I did a lot of criminal work in my life. And I represented a lot of <coughs> rappers who lived in a society that the only way they could get airplay is by being revolting. I lived in a society that still has not understand. And I did this and I tried to stop it. I wanted people to understand. You're so, 
Like I went to law school with Al Gore and his wife, they start censoring lyrics. Let it out, get it out. Yeah. But I tried to tell them all, I'm doing video games. These video games are teaching young people how to kill. I did a movie called Bully, which I helped them finish, which was about some kids that went and killed the bully. It's called Bully. You could see it. It's a good movie. That's They're copycatting. Why would you let a kid, 18 years old, who's playing with every killing video game exists, the right to go buy an AK-47? Are you kidding? How stupid, or an how stupid are you? Or an AR-15. Yeah. AR you, you can't and even buy- And those games are dangerous. Yeah, in most uh, most states, you can't buy a pack of cigarettes uh, until you're twenty one. You can't you can't buy a Playboy until you're twenty one. You um, you can't buy alcohol until you're twenty one, but you can buy an AR fifteen when you're eighteen. That's insane. It is insane. And any percent. And you want a definition of insanity? Is someone telling you you should be able to do it? You know, How could they justify it? I I. I I know what an AR-15 can do to somebody. It will. You said that, in a, yeah. Obliterate somebody. It it is designed to kill. It is designed to kill in such a way that you will not recover. That's what is designed. And you, if you ever seen, if you've ever seen what an AR-15 will do to somebody, the bullet will go in, and then your in the front, your back explodes. It's that simple. It it's is crazy. designed to kill. So, you know, yeah, don't, don't. You asked me a question that we both interrupted each other. You asked me what happens when you die. Yes. Is that the question you asked me? Yes. What happens when we die? Because so, we were talking about the body well, and that the body yeah. designed for maybe 120 years. Um, but so what happens when we so die? It, okay. You, your consciousness, you're now out of body and you're looking at your body. And you're like, okay, where do I go? And it's, you know, you have an eter eternal, time is created by a physical being, a physical awareness, and time is, time no longer exists. And you're looking and you're trying to figure out, where's my body? I've been set free. I can do whatever I want. You end up floating into an area that I believe the Catholic Church calls a purgatory, but I, I write in my book, it's called Amenati. Amanti, A-M-E-N-T-I. And it's where you go back, we're all basically released souls, for lack of a better word, but your body's consciousness, which is not connected to the higher consciousness, you go back and you, you live your lessons. You're still able to communicate with people. Empathics could communicate with this energy. You don't die. Energy does not die. Energy reforms and becomes a new energy. But at the same time, while you're sitting there, if you could ever learn how to let go until, okay, you didn't get what you wanted. Well, let it go. You tried, you know, or you could sit and decide, I'm going to come back. I'm going to do it again. And I go through it in detail for you, explaining to you the different levels of incarnation, reincarnation. And then I give you, according to the Egyptian mysticism and beyond, I give you the understanding of ascension. And that's right there in the book, the middle of the book is Ascension Land, where, okay, learned this lesson, played the game. It's like a video game platform. I played the game of Earth Life, and I'm going to go search for more. Or I'm going home to God. I'm going straight back to God, where I rejoin the consciousness, the stream of consciousness, which is like an ocean of consciousness into the eternity of everything and evermore, stuff that we cannot even begin to phantom. And I'll go back there and no longer be a single water drop of a consciousness, but I'll go back into the ocean or I'll go into the pool. And in the pool, I will go with other energies and go make a new matrix. I'll find f energy that feels like me looking to attract. I go through it at length and I, I walk you through, I give you a one-on-one -on -one education of quantum physics. And metaphysical truths and i could talk with you all day but well, you know if you like you could wrap up whatever you wanted to do if you have a couple more questions go for it um yeah i do actually the uh do, when we talk about reincarnation because i believe in reincarnation i've heard through my podcast and um the interviews that i've done in the past 
I've got different variations of what people believe in reincarnation. Some say that it you you go um, you come down here for lessons, and each time you go back out when you die, and you come back in, you have to learn a new lesson. And there are other ones that say there's like seven levels that you have to go through before you go to God, before you go to that collective that's at the top. Uh, do you do you believe in either one of those? Do you think that we come down here each time to learn something new? Yes. Or to relive something that went mm-hmm. wrong. You know, and, you know, and I, I've got stories in here. I give you different myths of different energies from China, from here or whatever. It's like... You'll come back here because, you know, you sit there and you have your parents' energy, your grandpa energy telling you what to do. You come here to get even. Well, that time doesn't exist. Or you come here to find the lost love of your life. Or you'll come back here to find the current love of your life because you two didn't finish it. You know, and all you're going to do is find the empires that turned into sand. And you don't know your past because when you agree, I'm coming back. Your past is wiped clean. You have no memory of it, except you may at one point start seeing deja vu. Right. And when you start seeing deja vu, what do you do? By the way, if you study how they select Dalai Lama, that's all past life. Mm-hmm. They sit there and they show the Dalai Lama the toys of the previous Dalai Lama and different possessions. And they go to see if this baby that they're told, this is where the Dalai Lama is reincarnated. <laughs> okay, the Dalai Lama reincarnated here. And and they believe this. And maybe they're right. Maybe they're wrong. But that's how they find the Dalai Lama. I'll be damned. I didn't know You know, that. and it's all, it's all energy. Like the Catholic Church, right? And there's a video. You could see me doing this. You know, because some guy got really mad at me when I was talking at his school. And there were 160 people, according to the count. And he says to me, you're making fun of my religion. My religion is not a multidimensional trip. I said, yes, it is. He goes, and he starts. I said, stay there. I said, stand up. And I go like this as loud as I can. I said, right now, Stephen Machat just died. He's next to my left foot. I said, right now, you're Peter. You're at the pearly gates. Everyone in this room can't see Stephen dead. And they can't see Peter at the pearly gates. But they know Stephen's dead. But your religion says, Stephen, something will now go meet Peter, who we can't see either, at the pearly gates. I said, excuse me. I respectfully submit that is nothing but a multidimensional trip. This guy didn't know what to do. I sold a lot of that one. <laughs> I, I, wish I, would, I wish I could have been in that one. I wish I could have been standing next to you. <laughs> the, guy, the guy comes up to me. He's threatening me. And he goes, can I hug you? I go, okay. Oh, his philosophy changed just a little. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's 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 amazing. That's brilliant. <laughs> uh, let's talk about this book. We've got to, to get out of this place. Um, I know that it reminds me of music. <laughs> um, <It> should <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's the first thing that came to my mind. Um, let's talk about the book and uh, how to get to it as well. Excuse me, as well, not and. Um, as well as the uh, your sacred knowledge. The book is based, I wrote a series of books called The Book of Earth. So the first book is called The Colonization of Earth, The Making of Mankind. It's seven acts. I wrote it as a play. And what I do in that book is I unravel the Bible. I've studied it and learned it and searched it out and asked questions and found out my own details. I've went to all the wonders, wonderful places in the earth to the different temples that still exist, to the, um, I've been around the planet and I did it through song and dance. So book one, the colonization of earth, the making of mankind is it's seven acts. And I unravel the Bible book eight, book two called taking Jesus off the cross. What I did there is I go through, I discuss Atlantis. I give you a hypothetical example of how Atlantis did exist. I teach you the metaphysics of density. I teach you how earth is built, how earth could displace earth with different energies. And then I go, okay, so great. Now what? I go into act nine where I discuss the creation of imperial religions and imperial governments. And what I try to answer in book one is how did we get into this body? And I tell you about 
the energy called gods that's referred to in the Bible, which the Bible is a rewritten story of the energies that created us. All them some God. And the one thing I got out of all the tablets I was able to read, and they were deciphered by men who give up their lives and energies to make it so people like me at a later date in the basically the road rally of life, handing off their wisdoms. They call themselves gods, but they said we all come from a creator. And they came here to get gold because their planet Nibiru, which is also in the Bible, was leaking. Its atmosphere was leaking. And they had different earth than we do. And they had an atmosphere that encased it as they traveled around the universe. And it took them 3,600 years to get around the universe. And so I tell you what they did, how they created mankind, it was made in the God's image. Yes, it was. And what they did is they went out and let them multiply. The God's image being the, the created at altered human bodies here. And if you look at it, there's 233 genes that came to Earth all of a sudden. They say it came from outer space if you analyze it, if you Google it. And by the way, I could not have written these books 10 years ago. Write it because I do research 24-7 just on the computer because I know what questions to ask, I know where to go, and then I know what further research to do. And I'm a builder of stars. I'm, I connect stars. I connect dots. So anyway, I connect this. And then, so I teach you about the imperial governments and imperial religions and how they create matrices, which keeps you in line with their thought process. You know, meet the new king, same as the old king. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. I mean, what are you doing? And then I tell you the story of Jesus and how he became Christ. And I give you the story as much as I could put it together, the game that people played. I tell you how a religion based on the love of Jesus, the messenger, the prophet, the Messiah, the Christos, who the Romans called Christian and changed it into God. He never said he was God. He said that I come from God. We are all the children of God. And I come to tell you that love is the answer. All of a sudden it becomes control with a religion that says we're going to go kill all those that don't believe in us. So I walked you through that. I walk you to the creation of the Islamics and how all of a sudden they appear to stop the massacres. And I'm not saying anything's right or anything's wrong, except there is one wrong, that we live in a world where we kill each other. And then what I did is I got real quiet and I finished this new book. And this new book is Act 14. It tells you what all the religions hint at, but they don't say to you. You get out of body and you go to a non-physical dimension. I give you what happens with religions and how they bury the dead and, and comfort the living. Act 15, I teach you about reincarnation as I was taught and as, as the masters before wrote about what they know and what they were able to conjure up. You know, we've had angels, we've had people reincarnate and tell us what they see. And we don't believe them, but yet we all believe the Bible, even though we make fun of it. And it's all in there. And then Act 16, I get into the Egyptian mysticism that I was taught and touched. And I just dissected it. And I couldn't get out. During my spare time, I read. I read a lot of books. Act 17, I said, hey, great. I just told you how to ascend. But why don't you do it? And I give you the reasons why. Because when you go back to the, to the others, your old friends are going to grab you. Your parents are going to grab you. You're going to want to prove your religion was correct. You're going to want to prove your nation should win. You're going to want to finish that song you couldn't finish. You're going to want to do this and you're going to want to do that. Well, good luck. As long as you want, you have a need. And as you have a want and you need, your energy, that particle has weight. And as long as you have weight, you're subject to the gravitation of the thought that lives inside that dimension that you're coming out of. And then in Act 18, I said, let me get you to the naked truth. Your energy, even though I tell you, you could go home to God, as long as you're a thought of any nature, with or without weight, all you're going to do is just find a new dimension to discover more. And maybe Peter Pan was right. Maybe the little prince was right. Maybe that I finally found my Debbie, who's sitting here and is my partner in this life. 
And Debbie was once Wendy and I'm Peter Pan. I don't know. But anyway, you're here to find out what you want to find out. I believe I'll ascend, but I don't know. Maybe I'll hear the calling to get there. If you're interested on Spotify and Apple, I give it away to you. It's called Sacred Knowledge. The Rock and Roll is Guide to Higher Consciousness. Listen to the prelude. It's 15 minutes of me talking to you. I give it away for nothing. I don't want that money. I want you to live in a world where I can play with you. I want to live in a world where we don't hate each other. I really want to live in a world where we could sit there and we could sit and look each other in the eye and go, all right, what are we going to do today? Let's go have some fun. Let's do something never done before. You know, and it's, let's just go live in a life. And I tell you, in the quantum physics truths, how you can't destroy energy. And then I answer the question that all these nuclear scientists want to know, that Albert Einstein wanted to know. They want to know, where did it all begin? And it began with thought. A thought becomes the word. And the thought is the light that went off. And the Bible is correct. Everything begins with the thought. Let's let the listeners and the viewers know where to come find you. Go to the school of sacred knowledge.com. Also, you go to Steve, S T E, well, you got it up there, S T E V E N M A C H A T dot com. And you'll, you'll discover me. And then if you forgot, just put in M A C H A T, and I'm the only one that will come up and go to Facebook, go to uh, Instagram. You know, I'm the first name that will come up. You'll know who I am. And I'll make sure all that's in the show notes so that people have an easy way to connect with you because I think you're a brilliant individual and I think what you've created for us as humanity uh, is something that everybody needs to uh, get involved in and listen and learn and uh, be educated and motivated and inspired by what you've created and, and moved forward. Um, Stephen, this is one more thing before you go. So before you and I go, do you have any words of wisdom you can share? Love life. It's a gift. Every time something's bothering you, and you may know this as well, just close your eyes and take slow breaths in through your nostrils and take give out slow breaths through your nostrils. Just keep your eyes closed. Count. Just stay there. And you know what's going to happen? You can open your eyes, and that anger you had is gone. It's over. You're back in the present. You're not in your past, which is your ass, and you're not in the future, which is angst. You're right here. Live in the moment. Enjoy the moment. And understand, you've got energies out there waiting to meet you. You've got energies out there to share with you. You've got energies out there. You know, people play golf, but they don't understand. that You may win the championship in golf, but the championship is building a team. And if you have a team, you can have a dream. And no matter how many dreams go bye-bye, there's other dreams for you to live. Dream, live, walk, walk on earth. And by the way, thank you for giving me the inspiration earlier. Your story touched my heart, and I do salute you and honor you. Thank you very and much. And I thank you. That touches my heart and my soul. I appreciate that very much. Stephen, thank you very much for being on One More Thing Before You Go. Thank you for sharing your journey. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your inspiration. I really appreciate it. And uh, I am ecstatic that we were able to connect and, and continue this. So thank you. No, thank you. And if you, if you read the book and you have questions, we're friends. Just let me know. I will do that. Thanks for listening to this episode of One More Thing Before You Go, a unique conversation about life. If you like our show and want to know more, check out our website at beforeyougopodcast.com. That's beforeyougopodcast.com. Tell your story, share your expertise, contribute to the blog, and subscribe to the newsletter. You can find us as well as subscribe to the program and rate us on your favorite podcast listening platform. And one more thing before you go. Have a nice day, have a nice week, and thanks for listening. One More Thing Before You Go, a unique conversation about life podcast, is a creation of One More Thing Productions, established 2010, all rights reserved.